I, I have a friend who's building a modest middle-class house right now and a garage doors that normally cost $2,000. He's paying $25,000 for an aluminum garage door. And you can repeat Jordan, maybe that that's story. another business for us. Can we, go, Jordan, can you, can we do garage doors, you think? I can do garage doors. Side? Yeah, I don't, okay. if, if you know how to install them, I can figure out how to sell them. No, uh, I, can't, I don't know how to do anything like that. You <laughs> have, but you have, you're a politician, you have no them? hard Wait, skills. Let me sell them. Let oh, me Jesus. sell no, let me sell the garage door. This is I Hey, I I've know. got a garage door for you, Morgan. It's written tell that lady, I've got a garage door for her. She's paying how much? Twenty how much you say? Twenty thousand? Twenty five. I can 000. do it for ten. We can do it for ten. We take our number, call us, Jordan and I'll be there. I'll bring the tools, Jordan will do the work. <laughs> Sold. <laughs> So, Jordan, you know, uh, the, the situation over there in Ukraine is sad. You know, you think about how many innocent people will be killed, injured, you know, freedom loving people, people that really wanted to just live a life a lot like we do in the United States. And then we see this brutal dictator move in there. It's a fast changing situation. We don't know how it's finally going to be resolved. Uh, and if it does get resolved, what it will look like. But I think all of us in America should be so grateful that, of course, we live here and secondly, do everything we can to offer support in whatever way we can to those people who, who live in the Ukraine. Uh, I mean, I, I couldn't agree with you more on that. It's, it's harrowing some of these images that are coming back now um, from Ukraine and our thoughts go out to, to everyone over there and people who are affected, people who have family over there. I think it does feel like... Uh, a moment where everybody's sort of taking stock of of your own families, of of, of this country in general. I, I I hate to say that in a moment like this, you'd hope like the better angels come forward, hearing people come together to focus on what matters. Uh, and I, you know, I, I, I hop on the news, I hop on social media, and I see already infighting and finger pointing. And I, I, I can't help but say part of today's experience hearing about the atrocities that are, are taking place and what might happen in the future, and also seeing kind of this country miss yet again another opportunity for, for unity or like joint purpose, and, and suddenly we're, we're fighting with one another, pointing fingers well, and, and adding it, to the problem. As you, know, it, it, as you know, on social media, though, sometimes they capture those dissonant voices, but I think by and large in the United States, uh, people want to support them. They, you know, it has to be made clear as to why this affects us and how we have common cause with, with um, the folks in the Ukraine. But um, this is not a time for you know, great criticism. This is a time for people to stand together in this kind of a situation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep, I, so. I, I, I agree. I think, I think where my disappointment has come is instead of uh, some people reaching out uh, expressing empathy towards what's going on yet again it becomes another another bullet in the chamber for culture wars or uh, attacks on the other side as opposed to kind of uh, an opportunity for unity which yeah. has been yes. again a disappointment but i'm 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 trying to stay hopeful and optimistic that uh, that right wins out in something like this but it's it's uh, it's been a dark day it's been a dark few days we'll move on here and so i i was really curious to see your reaction to that um, really terrible performance. Maybe you don't agree with that. When I saw the Michigan basketball coach uh, slap the assistant coach for Wisconsin, and I, when I saw that, I immediately thought about you and your love for the blue, and I don't know where you came down on that. I was really, really interested. <laughs> I think <laughs> I think it's a lot of hullabaloo over, you know, uh, a heated, tense moment. There was some regret from Jawan Howard. I know he apologized. When? when? How he long apologized. did it take him? Come People on. People need to get off their high horse. Guess what? So what happened? Let me guess. There was a spirited sporting event that people got upset at the end and there was pushing. And now suddenly everybody's like, how dare he? How dare he? I mean, this is, I don't know. Were you ever the fan of the Detroit bad boys? I love the bad boys. 
Bill yeah. Lambeer, part of what you watch with the bad boys is them punching other human beings. And suddenly we've, we've, we're uh, decades later and a guy kind of slapping an assistant oh, coach. Also, okay. not even a coach, an assistant coach. A guy kind of slapping an assistant uh-huh. coach. And suddenly, oh, oh, people are fainting in the aisles. How could this ever happen? How could it happen? It's sports. So, you're, so go- your, inner, your inner Detroit is coming out here because you love <laughs> Bill Lambeer and the knees to the groin and everything else. Yeah. Well, look, I, I, maybe I'm wrong about this, but I think coaches are like supposed to be a role model. I, I, maybe I'm wrong. Now, you might remember that famous incident where Woody, Woody Hayes, slugged yes. that guy on the, on the sideline. I didn't surprise you didn't lead with that as a comeback. Uh, you just <laughs> it was his own, to be, enough. to be clear, it was, it was his own okay. player. He hit his own player. No, he hit the player on the other team. Wasn't it, was it the other team? Yes. No, it was on the other team. And guess what they did to Woody? They, they fired, fired him. him. Yes. One, now maybe it was just one little hit, you know? Come on. That, but, but you Joel, can't be that much a no, blind that's, Michigan okay. fan for that. No, what, I know your dog is named Bo. I know that, but, you know. <laughs> my, my parents' dog is named Bo, so there's a lot of distance between the two. And to be clear, Woody Hayes hit a child. Juwan Howard pushed an assistant coach. So, I don't know. They feel different to me. Uh, I, I figured that they would, but I, I couldn't. I couldn't help but think of you immediately when I saw this. This scrum. People get upset. They lose their temper. It's built into the sport itself. I'm not condoning the actions of Jawan Howard. He shouldn't. He shouldn't. He should. He should be a role model to the the students that he coaches. Yes, yada yada yada. But guess what? He, he pushed an assistant. To be clear, an assistant coach. I think. I what think you, we can get what over. Do you think they're not human beings? Assistant coaches. Well, they're, they're at least they're lesser human beings. I'm not saying. I mean, if they were, if they're full, human if they're full oh. human beings, they're they're, they're like the. They're like the vice presidents of a coaching staff. Like, it is yeah. only important if something terrible happens to the head coach. Otherwise, they're practically useless. No. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what? It's interesting. The assistant coaches at a lot of these football programs like Ohio State and Michigan, these, these less than human people are being paid as much as $2 million a year for what? Where did we go wrong? Why are we doing this? And why aren't we assistant coaches, strength coaches? Well, I mean, we could definitely do that, or we could be, we could fire them up before the game, or fire them up at halftime, and you know, make no more than maybe a million and a half a piece. Why this, are we doing this? This is a good pitch, a great secondary career. I'll go into strength training. You O line, you know, yeah, it's it's easy. You work a couple months of the year. You tell some guys to push people as hard as they can. You make a million bucks. You retire. You you end up coaching the Ravens for a season and a half, and then you move to Louisiana and uh, end your days. It's a, it's a good yeah. life. Right. And then you live in a castle on the beach and, you know, what the hell? <laughs> hey, uh, so one last thing before we get to our, our great guest, who you and I are both, both interested in very much. Spring, right around the corner, right? I mean, forget, uh, forget Groundhog Day or whatever. Spring's my favorite season because it leads into my, well, it's my favorite because I know it's bleeding into summer, which I love as well. So what do you, what seasons do you, do you like spring? I'm, yeah, I'm a, a big winter se- guy, big seasons guy. I'm going to go, I'm going to go fall. I like fall. It's, it's crisp. It's cold. I'm, I have skinny arms. So I definitely like a, <laughs> a, a long sleeve shirt. Uh, football <laughs> starts, uh, you know, it's also a reminder. The leaves are dying. They're falling to the earth. And I think a reminder of death. It's memento mori. It's a reminder that we're all going to die. Uh, but there's <laughs> foot, but football's around the corner. So uh, I'm yeah. definitely a fall guy. Yeah, you know, I've never been big on the fall because fall leads to winter. So yeah. I don't know when fall ends and winter begins. So, But I like when spring, I don't know when spring exactly starts. When I say it starts in 1st of March. My wife says, what do you, you're, you're out of your mind. It's going to snow yet. But it does move into summer. And I got to think you love summer and you're going to love it this summer when you get that little whip out there in the park and start throwing the ball to them. That, that little guy. I can't wait to start playing catch or who knows, Frisbee, uh, any kind of device I'll pass his way. It's, we're going to have, we're going to have a little blast. I, I know it for sure. <laughs> it's going to be great. All right. Why don't you go ahead and if you would, Jordan, introduce our, our guest. I'll int- well, we're excited about this. I should say as a, as a preamble, uh, 
you and I both stumbled on our guest's book through separate means, and it was a little bit of kismet. Uh, you were reading a book, and we're like, this book is amazing. Uh, we should talk about finance. We should talk about money. It's rearranging the way in which I even think about money. And I asked you the name of it, and literally I had purchased the book uh, a week earlier because uh, someone in my building who is a lovely friend, she recommended it. She works in finance. She was like, you have to read this book. And I was like... Somebody I respect recommended it to me, and also the governor recommended it to me. This is a perfect. That was nice. Kismet. That was a nice. That was a nice compliment, Jordan. I like that. It was very sweet of you. <laughs> You've been practicing. <laughs> I'm excited. Let, let, let's bring Morgan on. Uh, if you don't know him, he's a longtime expert on behaviors and history and finance. He's a former finance columnist for the Wall Street Journal and Motley Fool, and a current partner at the Collaborative Fund. He's authored several best-selling books, including his most recent, The Psychology of Money, Timeless Lessons on Wealth, Greed, and Happiness, which is available. Now, uh, this is Morgan Housel. How you doing, Morgan? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. You, you heard the preamble here. Uh, you, you've made your way into both of our households. Have have you have you noticed that? I just saw that the book just eclipsed uh, a million sales, which is impressive because nobody buys books anymore. They just <laughs> half watch Netflix shows, so that must feel good. It feels good. Here's what's interesting about books: even if you feel like you are a somewhat of a talented author. Books are like a seed stage startup in the sense that even if you do everything right, 90% are going to fail. And that's, that's how it is. I always think in most things in life, 90% of virality is luck. Like not, not, not 100%, but 90% of virality is just the right person at the right time caught it and it kind of took off. So I really didn't have any expectations for the book when, when, when I wrote it. And the first print run was 5,000 copies because that's what we thought it would sell. And so it's been... It's been kind of confusing and shocking. I mean, it's great, of course, but it's been it's been kind of confusing to see what it's done over the last year. I mean, that's even built a little bit into your book, correct? This idea, sort of this almost reckoning with what fortune, what luck has to do with not only success on the uh, author stage, but also in investing and finance that maybe it's part of the... Uh, uh, <laughs> The uh, um, America, it's an American trait to overbelieve in luck or that fortune will, will shine on you. Uh, is, that, is that something that you, you see as uh, inherently uh, American, uh, this, this idea that luck will, will shine on us and things will be all right? I think what is really prevalent and probably more prevalent in America than anywhere else is a systematic underappreciation and ignorance of luck. And here's why. If I were to look at the two of you and say, your success is just due to luck, that makes me look like a jerk. That makes me look bitter, like I'm jealous. So I don't want to say that. Even if I know, and this is not just the two of you, but anyone with outside oh, success. Oh, so you're really secretly thinking that. Okay. That's really, really interesting. <laughs> but but Who's anyone... our next guest, Jordan? <laughs> yeah, Mark Cuban's coming up. He's a great guy. Yeah. <laughs> Understands the effort we put in to get here. Yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah, it's all luck, <laughs> but, Jordan, you know. You know, there's, there's a point I made in the book that Bill Gates went to the only high school in America with a computer. And you could say, like, is Bill Gates hardworking? Of course he is. Is he a genius? Yes, of course he's a genius. He's the, like, he's the genius of our time. But he had this ridiculous stroke of luck early on his career that without that, he would never have created what he did. And I think in any level of outside success, there is something like that. Even if it's just the generation you were born into, the country you were born into, that, you know, these things that are outside of your control that have a major impact on where you go. And I think we are, we tend to be ignorant of that because like I said, if I were to uh, put that on you, it makes me look like I'm jealous. And if I said that to myself, if I looked in the mirror and said, anything I've accomplished is due to luck, I don't want to admit that either. So we overlook luck in a, in a huge degree in a way that just makes it um, makes it difficult for us to look up to our role models and, and say, I want to do what they did. Because you can't emulate luck. You can't recreate luck. You can look up to someone who is a hard worker, who did X, Y, and Z, but you can't recreate their luck. And I think that just puts us on a path in life where we often have a hard time following the footsteps of people who we really look up to. Now, Morgan, we've had our first appearance by Jordan's son, Wit. Uh, he's about 24, about two years, getting close to two years of age. And he came on here and he made his appearance. I hope everybody heard him. And he wanted to know, forget all this luck stuff, okay? How am I going to get rich? 
That's what Witt wanted to know. And so the question is, when you're young, very young, how do you begin to think about accumulating wealth? I think there's a few things to think about. And first, I have two young kids, one of which is two years old, too. They will likely be making an appearance during the show as well. Um, I, I think there's, there's a couple of things to think about. One, if you, are a young, if you are a young child, then really the message is for the parents because there is no, obviously no better way that you can teach your kids about money than doing a good job yourself and teaching through example. And per, teaching through silent example, I think, is really important because particularly as your kids become teenagers, anything that your parents tell their kids to do, the kids are naturally going to rebel against it. So if you sit down your 15-year-old son or daughter and say, this is how you should invest, this is how you should save for the future, it's, it's in one ear, out the other. And I think the best you can do as a parent is just be lead as a silent example to what, what they can do. I think it's really true in, in politics. I'm curious, Governor, if you have views on this, but it's true in politics, from what I understand, that you inherit a lot of your political views, particularly from your father's political views, that when you're growing up, even if your parents don't sit you down and say, this is what's going on in politics. This is who you should vote for. You just kind of pick it up subconsciously. And I think money is really similarly. You see how your parents spend their money, what they value. Are they living paycheck to paycheck? Can they retire? And you just kind of pick up on that, on that yourself. And so I think that's, that's the first message is that this, that's really a message for parents. And then for, for everyone else, I think what goes overlooked so often in investing and money is two things. One is that wealth is what you don't see. Wealth is the money that people have not spent. That's what wealth is. It's money that you made and you said, I'm not going to spend this. I'm going to save it. I'm going to invest it. And that's really important because I can see the cars that you're driving and I can see the house that you live in and I can see the jewelry that you're wearing. I cannot see your bank account. I can't see your brokerage statement. So I have no idea what your net worth is. It's not visible. And once you accept that wealth is what you don't see, you again, it makes it really hard to know who to have for a role model. Because if you see someone who's driving a super fancy car or living in a really fancy house, the only thing that you know about that person is that they have less money than they did before they bought that fancy car. And there are so many very wealthy people in this country who you would never know. They drive a Toyota RAV4 and they live in a modest house in the suburbs and you would never in a million years know it. And the opposite of that is true as well, particularly in America, where it's such a material society, the number of people who look very wealthy and are actually just scraping by paycheck to paycheck is astounding once you dig into it. So once you accept that wealth is what you don't see, it's like, okay, that's the purpose of wealth is to build it up in a way where you're not spending it. And then the most important part here, this is my, my, my last point to this question is, what's the point of wealth if you're not going to spend it? If wealth is what you don't see, wealth is what you save, what, what the, what's the point of it? And that might seem like a gotcha question for some people, but there's actually, I think, a, a good answer that most people overlook, which is that what wealth does, what savings does, money you haven't spent, what it does for you is it gives you independence and autonomy and just the ability to do what you want, when you want, with whom you want. And that, I think, is, is a, a lever in life that can give you happiness well in excess of what most people get from buying stuff. It's not to say that I don't like nice stuff. I like nice cars. I like nice houses like everyone else. But if you, can if you can use your money to give yourself some level of independence and autonomy in life, I think that is the greatest path towards using money to actually give yourself a better life. Well, first off, I think you discount what a really expensive flashy car gets you. Yes, you lose $100,000. <laughs> but how do you... How do you look at and put a number to making other people feel jealous? I think that's one of the benefits of splurging on a fancy car, a really cool jacket, is the feeling you get making somebody else feel small. I mean, that's priceless. So it's, it's enormous. That's a huge, counterpoint. Huge, I, huge ROI. But here, no. But here's uh, to your point where I, I think this is this is really true that at different times in your life your willingness and desire to show off your money is totally different. So I completely understand why someone who's in their teens or early 20s who is like looking for a, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, like trying to make a name for themselves has a much higher desire to show off what, what they have than someone who's married with two kids, settled down in their 40s, like then it, it tapers off. So it's different throughout your life, like your desire to show off. We'll be right back. And now back to the show. Something I loved that resonated with me in your book, you talk about perhaps that I'm, I'm going to 
I'm going to hack this up here, but essentially one of the greatest dividends of wealth or money is the freedom to do what you want with time. Uh, it's, that's essentially what you, you are building wealth for is, the, is, is, is that freedom. I think that to me resonated. I'm reading a lot of books on stoicism, and I felt like a lot of the things that happened within your book felt like essentially this was just a stoics book on money. It was know thyself. It's drop the ego. Be aware of the things that you can control and forget the things that you can't control, a, a loss of material possessions, and especially like understanding that time is uh, the greatest resource that there is and that we're dying every single day. Uh, own the moment and the time that you have. Half the time I felt reading your book was that this was Seneca, only he's, he's talking about Morgan Stanley. It's... <laughs> Have you seen uh, an element of philosophy in the way, or or is there an element of philosophy in the way that you approach finance? Yeah, I, I think it's really true. I, look, at the, at the broad level, I would say the way that we tend to teach finance in schools or in the workplace, to the extent that it's taught at all, it's taught like a math-based field where it's like, what are, what's the data? What are the formulas? What do the charts look like? And I've always thought that finance is much closer to a uh, a softer science like psychology or philosophy or something like that, where you can't put it into formulas or data, but you know, it makes a huge difference in life. And a lot of what makes sense, like one, one, one of the reasons that stoicism is popular is because a lot of what works and what you should do is the opposite of what your knee jerk reaction is. It's the opposite of what seems intuitive you should do. And I think it's the same in finance. And that's why a lot of these philosophies are not complicated. They're not, it's not, it's not hard stuff. I'm telling you to be patient and drop the ego. It's not complicated, but it's the opposite of the knee jerk reaction that we all have when we're trying to climb the ladder in, in life and try to show off for our friends and what actually works, what's actually going to make you happy over the long run is the opposite of what you expected to begin with. I think that's kind of a, a, a philosophical point that aligns closely with stoicism. M Morgan, I, I, I was very interested. It, we do learn how to save or how to, how to live our lives or what we do with money, I think largely from our parents. And you wrote something in here that I think is so important for people who are listening to hear, and that is, it's not so important how much you earn as opposed to how much you save, right? That's a, that to me was a critical part of this book. Would you talk a little bit more about how much you save, not how much you earn? Because if you spend all that you earn, then you don't save, right? It's the most obvious point in the world that if you if you make a million dollars a year and you spend a million dollars a year, you're you're at zero. And if you make fifty thousand dollars a year and you spend thirty five, you're 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 ahead of the game. It's the most basic basic math that exists, but it's lost on a lot of people. That what really matters is not necessarily how much money you make. It's the it's your savings rate. One analogy to this is like, look, if you go to the gym and you work out for two hours and you're grinding away and you're sweating and you're lifting weights. And you're, and you're getting a great workout. And then as soon as you leave the gym, you go to McDonald's and you eat three Big Macs. You just canceled out everything that you did at the gym. So what matters for exercise is not what you did at the gym. It's not, it's not the sweating and the grunting. It's your ability to not counteract it afterwards that makes all the difference. And it's the same with money. It's not necessarily how much money you make. It's your ability to not spend what you make that accumulates to you and accumulates to wealth and gives you independence over time. And, and there are so many people, it's not hard to find these examples, people who make 40 grand a year that retire millionaires. And on the other end of the spectrum, people who make $10 million a year, $50 million a year, they go bankrupt. And it's astounding to watch that. It's, it, it defies logic, but it happens so often. And there aren't many other examples of that in other fields. Like you don't see complete amateurs who've never played golf just completely dominate a professional golfer. But that thing does happen in finance. And what that shows, I think it's just so easy to overlook, is just how much of this field is not about what you know or who you know. It's just how you behave. It's just what's going on inside of your head. If you have a lower income, uh, but you have a high propensity to save, you can be patient, you can keep your head on straight when the market's losing its cool, and you can do that for your whole life, you'll end up fine. You'll do totally fine financially over your life. And on the other end of that, you can be a partner at Goldman Sachs making $10 million a year. But if you don't have control over your greed or fear, and a lot of them don't, you can, and some of them do, lose everything. It's so simple and basic. It's just easy to overlook.
What, for for people who haven't read your book or think that books are silly or don't have the ability to read or the understanding how letters go together, what is the premise of The Psychology of Money? The premise is uh, very similar to what I just said, that what really matters in investing is not about how smart you are. It's about how you behave. That's really what it is. And I think that's important because that is widely overlooked in how investing and finance is taught. It's taught as math and formulas, which by the way, when you teach that in schools, when you teach a group of high schoolers, a bunch of formulas and data, they're, they're, they fall asleep in five minutes. They're not interested in it at all. But if you can teach finance through the lens of behavior, where you're telling stories about psychology and how people think about greed and fear, that tends to be much more interesting to people. I think it's more important and it's more interesting. I kind of got this idea or it became interesting to me when I started as a financial writer in 2008, which was when the world was falling to pieces, the financial crisis, everything was melting down. Yeah, smart and move. Just, uh, <laughs> it seems like really the time to jump into that industry. It was perfect timing, yeah. But I spent my first couple of years as a writer just trying to be like, what happened? Why did people do the things that they did during the housing bubble, during the financial crisis? I just wanted to explain why they did it. And there was nothing there's nothing in a finance textbook or an economics textbook that will explain why people did the things that they did. It's just not in there at all. But you could explain why people made these decisions if you were looking in like through the lens of psychology or, or politics or sociology. Very simple. Greed. Greed, Morgan. It was all greed. Well, I think that's, that's what it was all about. I think it's, I think that's a, I think that's a very important part of it, but, but there are other elements to it that might be kind of like cousins of greed, like incentives where most people underestimate the odds that if they worked at Bear Stearns in 2006 and someone dangled a $10 million bonus in front of them to manage a subprime portfolio, that they would have done it too. Most people underestimate how powerful and susceptible they are to incentives. My view, and this can be a, a controversial view, I know a lot of people don't agree with this, but my view is the huge majority of people who worked on Wall Street in the mid-2000s that quote unquote crashed the economy afterwards are good, honest, noble people who are working in a system with terrible incentives that caused them to make terrible decisions that they ended up regretting. Not all of them. There were some truly evil people in there. But I think it's, it's easy to overlook that incentive part of why people make these decisions. And again, that incentives, that's not in a finance textbook or economics textbook. That's psychology and sociology. It's all these things that we don't normally associate with money. Yeah, but Morgan, the people that work there, they're very smart. And they know when you pile risk upon risk upon risk upon risk, at some point, the chairs are going to collapse. And the reason they do it is because they want money, because they're greedy. I know. I spent time on, at that place, uh, and I know what it was like. And there, it doesn't mean that everybody there was bad. It doesn't mean, you know, it doesn't mean that at all. But there, is, there was a, in, at that time, it was like the subprime, this subprime business you talked about. People knew at some point that wasn't going to work, but they kept doing it, piling debt upon debt. But let me just ask you this question. So, some people have said, and you talk about the power of compound, of compounding, right? You go into the market, you stay into the market, you look at the trend in America for a long period of time. Some people have said, and it's not just people who are poor, but people who are not poor who get nervous, at the first sign of trouble, they're, they're running for the exits, they're pulling their money out. Talk about why that is a bad decision to pull your money out when you think about the long, the long haul, and it gets to financial literacy. So what, what do you have to say about the ability to stick through the tough time? Two really important points here. One is that everything in life that's worth pursuing has a cost attached to it. Nothing that, nothing that is great comes for free. That's obvious. So then, okay, we know you can make a lot of money in the stock market over a long period of time, but there's a cost to that. There's a, there's a, there's a fee that you have to be willing to pay. And the fee, the cost of admission, the fee that you pay is putting up with a constant chain of volatility and uncertainty and, and BS that comes with being an investor in the stock market where all these moves don't make any sense. You know, the stock market is down 15% or so in the last couple of weeks, couple of months. And it's, if, if you are a new investor, if you're a novice investor, it's easy to look at that and say, something's wrong. This is broken. I want out. Like I, I came across a stock market that doesn't work anymore. I want out. 
Whereas I think if you view it as volatility is the cost of admission, it's the price that I have to be willing to pay to do well over a long period of time. Of course, those gains don't come for free. The world is not set up so that you, you, you can become rich without putting in anything yourself, without any skin in the game yourself. So once you view volatility as the cost of admission, rather than a signal that something is broken and you made a mistake, then it becomes a little bit more palatable to deal with. That's the first point. The second with compounding is, this is, this is counterintuitive to most people, but if you want to maximize your, your wealth over time, you don't necessarily want to earn the best returns that you can earn in any given year. What you want to do is earn the best returns that you can sustain for the longest period of time. So rather than saying, what are the best returns I can earn this year? How can I double my money this year? What you, instead, you want to ask is, how can I earn decent returns and earn them for the next 50 years? Because that's when compounding actually works its magic. It's just the amount of time that you're holding it for that makes all the difference in the world. I use the example in the book of Warren Buffett, who's worth $100 billion. 99% of his net worth came after his 60th birthday. It was accumulated after his 60th birthday. That's not because he became a genius at age 60. That's just how compounding works. It's just the longer you hold it, that's when things start going crazy. So when you put those two together, when you view volatility as the cost of admission, and then all the good stuff in finance, it's just a matter of how long can you stay in the game for, then I think it makes compounding and endurance and dealing with volatility a little bit easier. Now, I'm super, super rich. So that's just kind of where I'm at right now. I'm like Howard Hughes, jars full of piss, rich. But it wasn't always that way, believe it or not. Uh, you know, I grew up hustling and I went into the really lucrative field of improv comedy where you make a good $20 every couple of weeks. Um, uh, needless to say, like a lot of people, I, I grew up not thinking at all about investing money, at all about saving money, just thinking about how to pay rent in places like Chicago and New York. And it wasn't until later in life where I got a little bit of scratch, enough to think, all right, how do I actually save some of this money beyond just paying rent for, for next month? When I reached that point, jumping into the world of finance, it felt like a foreign language. It felt like I walked into another country that I didn't know the language. And the first thing I had to do was not go with my instinct or gut, but find some sort of a translator to help me navigate that world. I think your book starts to talk a little bit about that, that sometimes these translators aren't super great at that language, or perhaps that language doesn't have a secret code. And how much is built into this financial marketplace to to confuse the novices so that they feel they need a guide to move through it? And how much of it is it, uh, should we dispense with those ideas that there's guides, that you need a guide to enter into it and, and understand that it's, it's more rudimentary than, uh, than trying to find that right person who knows the right things to get you to be super rich, like I very much am today. That's right. right. I think, I think part of it is innocent and part of it is not. There are, there is some degree where in the financial services industry, a lot of what the advice that you should be giving people is so basic that as a financial advisor, you can't really charge any significant fee for it. If you just tell people, Hey, save your money in an index fund and hold it for the next 50 years. It's hard to charge a big fee as a financial advisor for doing that. And because of that, the incentive for that financial advisor to say, oh, actually, you should do this crazy fancy thing. And I know a guy who can do this. And there's a better fund for that. And here's a unique strategy that I came up with myself that you can charge a big fee for, even if it's not the best advice for people to give. So that's the part that's not, you know, not necessarily um, that that kind of goes against the, 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 the average Joe on the street. There's another part of this where... There's, there's a thing in psychology called the curse of knowledge, which is when you are knowledgeable about a topic, you forget that other people don't understand the lingo that you have. And a lot of times a financial advisor will be talking to their clients and just talking straight over their head, but the client doesn't want to look like an idiot. So they sit there and nod their head politely like they get it. <laughs> I saw this firsthand one time many years ago when uh, I, I'm had, doing, I had- a, I'm doing it right now. <laughs> that that's currently what's happening as we speak. There's there's a real time curse of knowledge happening. But go on, Morgan. I totally get it. I, just, I, I saw this firsthand a couple of years ago when I went in with a family member um, to her financial advisor. I just wanted to tag along and see how it was going. And the financial advisor, we sat in, and the financial advisor looked at my my family member. And I'm, I'm trying to keep the identity. Uh, 
secret, but she, the financial advisor looked at my family member and said, yeah, interest, the, 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 the yield curve on interest rates are really good right now. So that's good for your bond portfolio. And this family member sat there nodding her head like she understood it. And I thought, there's no way you know what the yield curve is. There's no way you know what those words mean. Don't be but, selling your relative short. No, come on, Morgan. No, it's, it's, it's true. You're going to have to be, they know who this is. They're going to listen to this podcast and they're going to call you up and say, you insulted me. That's I'm fine. I can protect I, you here. Right, Jordan? I, can, I mean, yes, think about I, him. And, this and his, I was going to say, Morgan, let, let, let's give this relative a fake name so maybe they'll get yeah. caught up in this fake name. Like like uh, Blaze, your relative Blaze. <laughs> Blaze. Blaze sat there nodding her head. And I, I talked to Blaze oh, afterwards. Too. You, you, it's a good thing you're not trying to hide somebody's identity. <laughs> okay, I, I talked to him afterwards. Is that, is that better? <laughs> this is good. But yeah. No, you Keep better. Blaze. All right, good. But, Keep moving. But, this is, you're in the clear now. But I think I think that happens a lot in the industry where people on the other side of the table, the clients, don't want to look like they're not in the know. So they sit there nodding their head and it's not and it's just going in one ear out the other. And I think that's not the case like in medicine for something. People admit that they're that they're not doctors, that they don't understand medicine. So if the doctor uses a term they don't understand, they're fine to say like, whoa, whoa, whoa what, what is what does that mean? What, can you explain that to me further in a way that they don't in finance because everyone wants to look like a financial expert, particularly, I would say young males are the ones who are most susceptible to this, of wanting to look like they know what's going on. And therefore, even if they have no clue what's going on, they will pretend that they do and sit there nodding their head. Morgan, uh, my financial advisor has given me some very, very good advice. And it's very simple. Are you ready? Let's hear it. Pigs get, pigs get fat and hogs get slaughtered. Now, that's really good advice because that gets back to the amount of earnings that you want to have the returns you want to have in a single year, as opposed to trying to smooth them out and be consistent over a long, long period of time. Also, to but be clear, in the, Ohio, the only financial advisors are also butchers. So that's just <laughs> that's just what happens in Ohio. So continue, Governor. Yeah. So, Morgan, the, the issue with a financial advisor, though, I, and I know how index funds work, but it's really about diversifying, right? You don't want to put all your eggs in one basket right? That would be, that's one thing people need to know. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. And remember, pigs get fat and hogs get slaughtered. You want to comment on that philosophy? Good advice from the butcher. I would say, um, look, I, I think the, the biggest thing with diversity, if you're just saying what percentage of your money should be in stocks versus bonds versus cash, the way to think about it is this. When, when the stock market crashes, you want to make sure that you are buffered and you have uh, and you have an airbag in the rest of your in the rest of your portfolio to prevent you from making a rash decision from selling your stocks. So if you were to have, I'm making this up, a third of your money in cash, a third of your money in bonds, then when the stock market crashes, it, it doesn't it doesn't feel as bad. Your total net worth didn't go down by that much as much as the stock market did. So maybe it's going to prevent you from panicking and selling. That's 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 the reason that you want a decent chunk of your net worth right. in stocks and bonds. It's not because you're going to earn any higher return. It's just going to prevent you from making rash decisions when the market may or does crash. When you get older, a lot of people say, okay, well, you know, you've got to put everything into bonds, you know, and old is it, you know, it, it's, it depends on how you look at old, but the ability to, but the willingness to get overly conservative is also uh, not a good choice either, is it? I think it's especially true right now. The inflation rate right now is seven and a half percent. So if you are someone who had 100 percent of your money in bonds that are probably earning you two percent per year, if that, and you're losing seven and a half percent to inflation, then every year your total net worth is just shrinking and evaporating before your eyes. So you, it feels like it's low risk, but it's actually this this like silent drain on your net worth that's that's pulling it back. Now, it is true that particularly as you get older, that your your ability to withstand risk in the stock market is is way less. During the Great Depression in the 1930s, the market fell 90% and took 25 years to recover. And even after the 2000 dot com bubble burst, the market fell you know 40% and took 12 years to recover. If you're in your 70s or 80s and you're retired, that's not something you you can deal with. If you're in your 20s and your 30s, it sucks, but you can deal with it. But as you get older, that's it's just a completely different willingness to grow your money. There's also this thing where that I really love that we don't talk about very often, which is how many people 
in their 70s and 80s need to grow their net worth or need to grow it at a significant rate. And there are some that absolutely do just to pay their bills. But Daniel Kahneman, who is a famous psychologist who won the Nobel Prize, he had this thing where he tells a story about he went to his financial advisor and he said, I have no desire to grow my net worth at all. I, I have no desire to see my net worth $1 higher than, than it is for the rest of my life. I just, I have this pot of money and I just want to live off of it comfortably and that's it. And the financial advisor said, I can't work with you. She fired him as a client because to her, the idea that someone would not want to get richer was, was antithetical to how she thinks. Whereas to Kahneman, this Nobel Prize winning psychologist, he didn't see any reason or desire to get wealthier. And I think as he told the story, more there are lots of people in society who are actually like him, who, just, who don't have a desire to become the richest man in the graveyard. They just want to live comfortably on what they have. I, I think that, that actually brings up an interesting point. Uh, if we take a step back, um, as somebody who is, again, very, very rich, but perhaps a novice in the finance world, I do think you, you embrace this idea. What is the psychology of money? What is the psychology of people who invest, uh, should invest in the relationship to money? And for me, I think once you start to get into this world and start thinking money, 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 what is the psychological toll of being all in considering the world of money, considering constantly thinking about that? And like, how, how do you balance those types of things? Being somebody who is uh, financially literate in a way that is effective and productive for their lifestyles and their families. Uh, but at what point also is becoming financially literate uh, have a negative impact on your overall well-being because your life is focused on this this capitalistic game that, as many of us know, can lead to ruin, anxiety, and the kinds of things that pull you away from lovely things like family, books, and uh, uh, red wine. I think it's such a good point that that we don't talk about enough. Some of the most interesting financial research I've seen is that financial literacy programs, while they mean well, of course, they're trying to do good, they actually end up backfiring. Because basically what happens to, to, to grossly generalize it is if you take uh, an 18-year-old who doesn't know anything about finance, and then you put them through a financial literacy class, that 18-year-old might take what little knowledge that they learned and go home and start day trading penny stocks. Be like, oh, I learned about the stock market. That sounds fun. Let's go day trade bankrupt penny stocks. And it ends up backfiring on them. So I, I do think that there is a fine balance between like understanding finance and being completely overwhelmed with it and, and using what little knowledge you have to shoot yourself in the foot. I, 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 I do think though that most people can comfortably find a balance. It's sort of like like exercise. Most people exercise not because they want to become the next Michael Phelps. They just want to, you know, like live a healthy life and not be overweight and make sure they don't die of a heart attack prematurely. That's their only goal. I think the huge majority of society has that with finance too. They don't want to become the next George Soros. They don't want to become the next Warren Buffett. It's just like, can I live comfortably? Can I pay my bills? Can I retire when I'm 65? If I check those boxes, I don't ever want to think about this ever again. That's probably like 90% of society. It doesn't seem like that because if you turn on CNBC or if you're, if you're on Twitter or whatnot, you see people who are just completely obsessed with finance and there is no world outside of the stock ticker to them. And that, that tends to be what we, what we see on a, daily, on a daily basis. What's going on in the stock market? Even like the non-financial news talks about what did the stock market do today? What's it going to do tomorrow? Where do analysts see it going next quarter? 90% of America doesn't care about any of that. We'll be right back. And now back to the show. Morgan, here's, here's a question really for Jordan and I, because he's not going to manage his money. I'm not going to manage money. We're going to have somebody that's going to give us direction and somebody we trust. There's just two final things I want to know is how do you find somebody that you can really trust? But the other issue is the issue of a cushion. How important is for somebody to have a cushion? Because what's good ultimately turns the other way and what turns the other way gets better. Where does yep. the cushion fit in? Well, let me, let me start with how you, how you might look for a financial advisor, how you're looking for help. Here's what's really interesting. To be a doctor in America, you have to be an MD. Full stop. There's no exceptions. You can't just be, just like hang up a shingle and say, I'm a doctor, come in and I'll help you. That's not how it works. For a financial advisor, you can effectively do that. You, have, you might have to be registered with some regulators, but you don't need any deep credentials to be a financial advisor. And there are a lot of people who have very little experience, very little training. They passed an easy test for the state regulator and boom, they hang up a shingle. They can now manage your money. Now, there are some really important credentials 
that people that will show that this financial advisor has really put in the time and the education and the training to prove they know what they're talking about. The most important one is called CFP, Certified Financial Planner. If your financial advisor has CFP after their name, you can be damn sure that they spent years training and studying and passing really hard tests to prove that they know what they're talking about. It's the equivalent of an MD uh, in, in finance. That's it, it, If you have that, you've checked nine out of the 10 boxes that you need. After that, it's just the dating test of like, when you sit across the table from this person, do you trust them? Do they, do they think they're, they're, they're full of it? It's just like, it's just getting to know the, the trustworthiness of that person, which is much easier said than done, but that's, that's what it is. The second part about a cushion is so important. And, and, and here's why. If this was 2019, let's go back two years ago, three years ago, excuse me. And, um, and, and, and we said, what, what's the biggest economic risk that's staring at us right now? The three of us may have said, oh, government deficits. We may have said trade wars. We may have listed off a half dozen things of what seemed like, like the biggest economic risk. None of us would have said a virus that's going to shut down the global economy and 25 million people are going to lose their jobs in a month. None of us would have said that. Nobody would have said that at the time, but that's what happened. The biggest risk is always what you don't see coming. You can even say that right now about if this was the one year swan. ago. The black it's the swan. Black swan. Event. And it's, it's what no one's talking about. Even if this was six months ago, none, none of us would have said uh, Russia is going to invade Ukraine. There are lots of people in geopolitical circles maybe saying that, but your average Joe on the street was not thinking about it in the slightest. It's always the case. The biggest risk is what no one's talking about. And that's where the cushion comes in, because if you are only saving money for the risks that you can foresee, you're going to miss the surprise 10 times out of 10. And the surprise is always what moves the needle more than anything. So you, you know you have the right amount of savings when it feels like it's too much. When it feels excessive, that's when you know you're saving for the surprise that you or anyone else can't even envision. And that's why it's so important. Is that, I mean, you wrote this book pre-pandemic. When you think about where we are now, where we're heading, is there any other times you look back to or think about financially uh, that could help us navigate the period that we're in now? I, I feel like the closest that we have to what's going on right now in this moment is probably in the few years after World War II, where we kind of felt like, okay, we, we dodged the biggest bullet, that's over, but the economy is completely broken. In the, 19, in the late 1940s, all the supply chains were broken because we retooled the factories to make tanks and planes for the war. And then when the war was over, we were like, oh, we, we can't build cars and washing machines anymore. So there's a huge supply chain breakdown. Inflation like soared through the roof uh, in, in the late 1940s, early 1950s. You had really high unemployment. Like it was a it was a broken economy. It wasn't necessarily that there was like a financial crisis. It was just supply chains were broken. That's what we're going through right now. And I, I think I think that's that's the biggest analogy to where we are today. Now, what happened after we got through that? Well, it was like three or four years of pain where everything was broken. And after that, we had the glorious 1950s, 1960s, like the, one of the biggest economic middle-class booms the country has ever seen. That's not to say that that's what's going to happen next, but I, I think what we're going through now is like the most acute, severe supply chain crisis that we've seen in 80 years. And it's bad. And it might last another two or three years. You know, I, I have a friend who's building a modest middle-class house right now and a garage door is it normally costs $2,000. He's paying $25,000 for an aluminum garage door. And you can repeat Jordan, that story. Jordan, maybe that's another business for us. Can we, Jordan, can you, can we do garage doors, you think? I could do garage doors. Side? Yeah, I don't, okay. if, if you know how to install them, I can figure out how to sell them. No, uh, I, can't, I don't know how to do anything like that. You <laughs> have, but you have, you're a politician, you have no them. hard Wait, skill. Let me sell them. Let oh, me Jesus. sell no, let me sell the garage door. This is I Hey, I don't I've know. got a garage door for you, Morgan. It's written tell that lady, I've got a garage door for her. She's paying how much? Twenty how much you say? Twenty thousand? Twenty five thousand. I can 000. do it for ten. We can do it for ten. We take our number, call us, Jordan and I'll be there. I'll bring the tools, Jordan will do the work. <laughs> Sold. <laughs> we could. <laughs> Sold. If you were born after the early 1980s, you've never experienced inflation in any meaningful way in your whole life. The last time we had high inflation was the late 70s, early 80s. And so you have people who are in their early 40s for whom this is completely new to, and they have no experience with dealing with 7% inflation. So it's just a completely new thing that we thought was a thing of the past that we had overcome that we're all dealing with now. There's a, a chapter in your book, 
you talk about the stories we tell and how stories are important to the financial markets in a, in a couple different ways. Uh, I think one of the things that I think is interesting is we, we look back at history, we see these spikes, and then we kind of retrofit it to make stories uh, make sense as to what we saw coming, when in reality, uh, we didn't necessarily see it coming, and uh, we didn't know how to navigate it at the time. But also stories are ways to uh, that have actual effects on something like the market. They have actual effects financially. GameStop is a, an example of something that took out a narrative unto itself. It feels like even in the worlds of, of crypto right now, uh, Elon Musk can hop online and, and craft a story that changes and moves markets. How much of this, I guess here's an inelegant question, but how much of this is bullshit? I think the, 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 the answer is lots of it. But then the, the second answer is that's always been true. It's always been true that narratives and stories are the biggest driver of the economy. A narrative of pessimism, a narrative of optimism, a narrative of we're the best, a narrative of tech's going to change the future. That's, uh, that's always been the case and that always will be the case. Everything that's going on in the economy is just like a number or a fact from today multiplied by a story about tomorrow. Everything that's going on, everything that's going on in the stock market, everything that's going on, you know, the, how people feel about the future, it's a number multiplied by a story. And particularly in the social media age, which is like 10 years, of course, it's not that long, people can come up with crazy stories that just like rip around the world in two seconds. So even though stories have always been part of the economy, whether it was the 1920s, the 1930s, it's always been the case. The, the ability to create a crazy, insane story and for hundreds of millions of people to latch onto it today is is like we've never seen it before. And I don't think we understand the consequences of that. Things like GameStop and whatnot, there's always been bullshit in the, in the stock market like that, but not, not to that degree and not with that many people participating in it and not that's lasted to the extent that it has. So I think we're just in a new era of storytelling where there's people like Musk that know that and they're good storytellers. They know how to get people's attention. They know what's going to get inside of people's heads and they use it to their advantage. And no matter what the industry is, it's true for politicians as well. For people who understand that, how powerful it is to create a story in this era, an era that didn't even exist 10 years ago, those are the people that have the most power these days. Morgan, I have to say, a lot of people ask me and they ask Jordan, they say, well, what are you guys doing? And now all of a sudden we, we have a financial advisor on and I'm hoping that people will hear this and they'll gain from it. So if you were to say uh, a couple things, you know, in a short period of time, what advice you have for people, young or old, when it comes to handling their money, to, and, and not that they should worship their money, the money, as you say, gives them independence and freedom, what would those couple things be? Okay, I, I, the first thing I would say is, and you just mentioned this, the way that you can use money to give you the most amount of happiness in life is giving yourself, using it to give yourself independence and autonomy. We don't talk about that enough. Once you experience a little taste of freedom and independence, you'll realize that nothing in your, in your financial life is going to make you happier than that. That's the first thing. The second thing I would say is, look, if you want to be healthy, just eat your vegetables, go for a run and, and get eight hours of sleep. That's like 90% of what you need in order to, to live a moderately healthy, healthy life. It's really simple and basic. And finance, it's the same. The industry has been designed to be very complex and very intimidating for average people. But if you just spend less money than you make, save the difference, invest in an index fund and be patient, that's 90% of what you need to know to do well over time. It's not complicated in the slightest. It's not, like, it's not advertised like that. People who you're paying to be a financial advisor will rarely tell you that. But it's true for the ordinary people. Like, virtually everyone has enough intelligence to do well financially over time. They just need to understand the few basic behaviors that will get them there. But it's, it's, it's accessible to almost everyone these days. And we often overlook how lucky we are to live in a world where there are financial products, good, cheap financial products for the masses. That didn't exist 30 or 40 years ago. 30 or 40 years ago, if you wanted to invest in the stock market, you needed to be rich. You needed a stockbroker from Merrill Lynch to even participate. And now people with $100 can open up a Robinhood account, buy a couple stocks, open up a Vanguard account, and invest $100 in an index fund. You can do that right now. It's opened up to the masses in a way that it wasn't before. 
How do, how do you stay optimistic? I think there's there's a lot of folks who are out there who see this kind of discussion, this type of uh, autonomy as very much a privilege. And they hear stories of CEOs who don't want to lower the profit margins and uh, take on giant bonuses. And, and what ends up happening? Well, well, we get inflation and we get uh, all this money that doesn't trickle down to the workers. It just ends up uh, uh, story after story in the pockets of the folks with money. They get to keep money and they figure out ways in which they get to keep more money later on. Um, how do you break through? And what, what, what is your message to people who are out there who are jaded? They're pessimistic about not only the, um, the financial system, but their ability to even, even begin to have a conversation about how to get their own freedom and autonomy in a world that already seems stacked against them. I would say that most bad news happens very quickly. So it's hard not to pay, not to, not to notice it. And most good news happens very slowly. The good news is more powerful over time. It's, it, it creates a much better world over time, but it happens so slow that most people don't even recognize it. But if you were to look at how much progress we've made for your average, typical, median, middle-class family, how much progress they've made, compare them, compare their lives today versus 50 years ago. And I don't think hardly any of them would actually trade places with where we were 50 years ago. We've made so much economic progress. That's not to say that there's not more to do and there are things that are unfair that we should try to remedy. It's not to discount any of that, but we've made so much economic progress in the last 50 years, even the last 20 or 30 years. And it's easy to ignore because it happens slowly. The things that happen quickly, like pandemics and stock market crashes, that captures our attention. That makes the headlines. But the good news is slow. And I think if you zoom out and see where we've been in the last 100 years, in the last 50 years, even in the last generation, most people, if they're honest with themselves about what the world was like 30 or 40 years ago, would not trade places. But what life expectancy was like, what medicine was like, what average median wages were like, there are things you can cherry pick that were better 30 or 40 years ago. But on whole, the average typical middle class family is better off today than they've ever been. I think that could, that could be controversial, but if you dig into the data, I think that's true. And I think if people did it themselves, they would realize that we've actually made a lot of progress. And when you realize that we've made progress during an era where we had 9-11 and a financial crisis and a pandemic and politics in the state that it is, we've made progress during that era. Then going forward, if you look at the next 50 years, the rest of our lives and our children's lives, it's, it's hard not to be optimistic, I think. I think we, we have everything that we take, that, that we need to achieve that optimism. It's just, do you have the patience and the fortitude to stick with the bullshit to get there? Amen. Amen to that. And uh, Morgan and, and, and Jordan, Brandon McIntyre, a young man who helps me with my finances and, and, his, and his colleague, Bob Roach. And I mentioned those two names. Uh, Brandon sent me your book and it's interesting. He said, read the book. It'll make things simple for you. And the reason I mention those two names is we need, if, when I'm going to tell them that I mentioned their names, they will then listen to the podcast. And we need all the listeners we can possibly get. So Fair enough. Thank there's, you, Morgan, for, for joining us. I, I really enjoyed this. I hope our folks did. We'll get you some feedback. This is great. Thanks, guys. Yeah, don't worry. We'll get you all, all the negative comments. We will uh, post them. If you could just leave your address, uh, we'll send it your way. Uh, you know, low expectations uh, uh, kind of puts things in, in perspective. So uh, don't worry. Just leave your address. We'll send you all that kind of stuff. S -s send them my way. This has been fun. <laughs> uh, Morgan's latest book, The Psychology of Money, Timeless Lessons on Wealth, Greed, and Happiness, is available now. Morgan, thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Kasich and Klepper is a production of Treefort Media, hosted and executive produced by John Kasich and Jordan Klepper. Treefort Media's executive producers are Kelly Garner, Lisa Ammerman, and Matthew Kuglin. Line producer is Oscar Guido. Audio direction by Tom Monahan, head of audio for Treefort. With production and editing by Maxwell Carney. Talent booking by Blythe Asher. With additional production help from Tim Schauer, Haley Mandelberg, Colin Motel, and Anastasia Ibrahim. This podcast is powered by Acast.